Welcome to this YouTube channel. In this video we are going to talk about 10 facts about Muhammad Mossadegh. So before starting this video like the video, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Muhammad Mossadegh, the 16th of June 1882, the 5th of March 1967, was an Iranian politician, who served as the 35th Prime Minister of Iran, holding office from 1951 until 1953, when his government was overthrown in the 1953 Iranian coup d'etat orchestrated, by the United States Central Intelligence Agency and the United Kingdom's MI6. Number 10. An author, administrator, lawyer, and prominent parliamentarian, his administration introduced a range of social and political measures such as social security, land reforms, and higher taxes including the introduction of taxation of the rent on land. His government's most significant policy, however, was the nationalization of the Iranian oil industry, which had been built by the British on Persian lands, since 1913 through the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, APOC, AIOC, later known as British Petroleum, BP. Many Iranians regard Mossadegh as the leading champion of secular democracy, and resistance to foreign domination in Iran's modern history. Following an initial, failed coup attempt by the CIA, MI6-backed General Fazlollah Zahedi, Mossadegh resigned four days later on 19 August 1953, with Zahedi succeeding him, as Prime Minister. While the coup is at times referred to in the West as Operation Ajax, after its CIA cryptonym, in Iran it is referred to as the 28 Mordad coup d'etat, after its date on the Iranian calendar. Mossadegh was imprisoned for three years, then put under house arrest until his death, and was buried in his own home so as to prevent a political furor. In 2013, the US government formally acknowledged the US role on a coup, as a part of its foreign policy initiatives. Number 9. Mossadegh was born to a prominent Persian family, of high officials in Tehran on 16 June 1882. His father, Mirza Hidayatullah Ashtiani, was the finance minister under the Qajar dynasty, and his mother, Princess Malik Taj Najms Sultaneh, was the granddaughter of the reformist Qajar Prince Abbas Mirza, and a great-granddaughter of Fath Ali Shah Qajar. When Mossadi's father died in 1892, his uncle was appointed the tax collector of the Khorasan province, and was bestowed with the title of Mossadegh os Sultaneh by Nasser al-Din Shah. Mossadegh himself later bore the same title, by which he was still known to some long after titles were abolished. In 1901, Mossadegh married Zara Khanum, 1879-1965, a granddaughter of Nasser al-Din Shah through her mother. The couple had five children, two sons, Ahmad and Ghulam Hussein, and three daughters, Mansura, Zia Ashraf, and Khadija. Number 8. In 1909, Mossadegh pursued education abroad in Paris, France, where he studied law at the Institut d'études politiques de Paris, Sciences Po. He studied there for two years, returning to Iran because of illness in 1911. After five months, Mossadegh returned to Europe to study a doctorate of laws, doctorate en droit, at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. In June 1913, Mossadegh received his doctorate and in doing, so became the first Iranian to receive a PhD in law from a European university. Mossadegh taught at the Tehran School of Political Science at the start of World War I, before beginning his political career. Number 7. Mossadegh started his political career, with the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1905-07. At the age of 24, he was elected from Isfahan to the newly inaugurated Persian parliament, the Majis of Iran. However, he was unable to assume his seat, because he had not reached the legal age of 30. During this period he also served, as deputy leader of the Society of Humanity, under Mostofi ol Mamalek. In protest at the Anglo-Persian Treaty of 1919, he relocated to Switzerland, from where he returned the following year, after being invited by the new Iranian Prime Minister, Hassan Pernia, Moshir Ed Dawla, to become his Minister of Justice. While en route to Tehran, he was asked by the people of Shiraz, to become the governor of the Fars province. He was later appointed finance minister, in the government of Ahmad Kavim, Kavim os Sultaneh, in 1921, and then foreign minister in the government of Moshir ed Dawla in June 1923. He then became governor of the Azerbaijan province. In 1923, he was re-elected to the Majlis in 1925 the supporters of Reza Khan, in the Majlis proposed legislation to dissolve the Qajar dynasty, and appoint Reza Khan the new Shah. Mossadegh voted against such a move arguing, that such an act was a subversion of the 1906 Iranian constitution. He gave a speech in the Majlis praising Reza Khan's achievements as Prime Minister, while encouraging him to respect the constitution and stay as the Prime Minister. 
On 12 December 1925, the Majlis deposed the young Shah Ahmad Shah Qajar, and declared Reza Shah the new monarch of the Imperial State of Persia, and the first Shah of the Pahlavi dynasty Mossadda then retired from politics, due to disagreements with the new regime. Number 6. In 1941, Reza Shah Pahlavi was forced by the British to abdicate in favor of his son Muhammad Reza Pahlavi. In 1944, Mossadda was once again elected to parliament. This time he took the lead of Jeva Meli, National Front of Iran, created in 1949, an organization he had founded with 19 others such, as Hossein Fatemi, Ahmad Zirazadeh, Ali Shiegan and Karim Sanjabi, aiming to establish democracy and end the foreign presence in Iranian politics, especially by nationalizing the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company's AIOC, operations in Iran. In 1947 Mossadda once again announced retirement, after an electoral reform bill he had proposed failed to pass through Majlis. Number 5. On 28 April 1951, the Shah appointed Mossadda as Prime Minister, after the Majlis Parliament of Iran nominated Mossadda by a vote of 79 to 12. The Shah was aware of Mossadi's rising popularity and political power, after a period of assassinations by Fadrian e Islam and political unrest by the National Front. Demonstrations erupted in Tehran after Mossadi's appointment, with crowds further invigorated by the speeches of members from the National Front. There was a special focus on the Anglo-Iranian oil company and the heavy involvement of foreign actors and influences in Iranian affairs. Although Iran was not officially a colony or a protectorate, it was still heavily controlled by foreign powers, beginning with concessions provided by the Qajar Shahs, and leading up to the oil agreement signed by Reza Shah in 1933. The new administration introduced a wide range of social reforms. Unemployment compensation was introduced factory owners were ordered to pay benefits to sick and injured workers, and peasants were freed from forced labor in their landlords' estates. In 1952, Mossadda passed the Land Reform Act which forced landlords to turn over 20% of their revenues to their tenants. These revenues could be placed in a fund to pay for development projects such as public baths, rural housing and pest control. Number 4. Mossadda nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company, cancelling its oil concession, expired in 1993, and expropriating its assets. Mossadda saw the AIOC as an arm of the British government controlling much of the oil in Iran, pushing him to seize what the British had built for Iran the next month, a committee of five Majlis deputies was sent to Khuzistan to enforce the nationalization. Mossadda justified his nationalization policy by claiming Iran was the rightful owner of all the oil in Iran, and also pointing out Iran could use the money in a 21 June 1951 speech, our long years of negotiations with foreign countries have yielded no results thus far. With the oil revenues we could meet our entire budget and combat poverty, disease, and backwardness among our people. Another important consideration is that by the elimination of the power of the British company, we would also eliminate corruption and intrigue, by means of which the internal affairs of our country have been influenced. Once this tutelage has ceased Iran will have achieved its economic and political independence. The Iranian state prefers to take over the production of petroleum itself. The company should do nothing else but return its property to the rightful owners. The nationalization law provides that 25% of the net profits on oil be set aside to meet all the legitimate claims of the company for compensation. It has been asserted abroad that Iran intends to expel the foreign oil experts from the country and then shut down oil installations. Not only is this allegation absurd it is utter invention. Number 3. The confrontation between Iran and Britain escalated, as Mossadi's government refused to allow the British any involvement in their former enterprise, and Britain made sure Iran could sell no oil which it considered stolen. In July, Mossadda broke off negotiations with AIOC, after it threatened to pull out its employees and told owners of oil tanker ships that receipts from the Iranian government would not be accepted on the world market. Two months later the AIOC evacuated its technicians and closed down the oil installations. Under nationalized management many refineries lacked the trained technicians that were needed to continue production. The British government announced a de facto blockade reinforced its naval force in the Persian Gulf and lodged complaints against Iran before the United Nations Security Council. Number 2. The British government also threatened legal action against purchases of oil produced in the formerly British refineries seized by Iran, and obtained an agreement with its sister international oil companies not to fill in, where the AIOC was boycotting Iran. The entire Iranian oil industry came to a virtual standstill, oil production dropping from 241,400,000 barrels, 
38,380,000 cubic meters, in 1950 to 10,600,000 barrels, 1,690,000 cubic meters, in 1952. This Abaddon crisis reduced Iran's oil income to almost nothing, putting a severe strain on the implementation of Mossadegh's promised domestic reforms. At the same time, BP and Aramco doubled their production in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and Iraq, to make up for lost production in Iran so that no hardship was felt in Britain. Still enormously popular in late 1951, Mossadegh called elections. His base of support was in urban areas and not in the provinces. This fact was reflected in the rejection of Mossadegh's bill for electoral reform, which no longer disqualified illiterates from electoral participation by the conservative bloc, on the grounds that it would unjustly discriminate patriots who had been voting for the last 40 years. According to Irvand Abrahamian realizing that the opposition would take the vast majority of the provincial seats, Mossadegh stopped the voting as soon as 79 deputies, just enough to form a parliamentary quorum had been elected. An alternative account is offered by Stephen Kinzer. Beginning in the early 1950s under the guidance of C.M. Woodhouse, chief of the British intelligence station in Tehran, Britain's covert operations network had funneled roughly £10,000 per month to the Rashidian brothers, two of Iran's most influential royalists, in the hope of buying off according to CIA estimates, the armed forces the Majlis, Iranian parliament, religious leaders, the press, street gangs, politicians and other influential figures. Thus, in his statement asserting electoral manipulation by foreign agents, Mossadegh suspended the elections. His National Front Party had made up 30 of the 79 deputies elected. Yet none of those present vetoed the statement and the elections were postponed indefinitely. The 17th Majlis convened in February 1952. Number 1. In August 1953 the Shah finally agreed to Mossadegh's overthrow, after Roosevelt said that the United States would proceed with, or without him and formally dismiss the Prime Minister in a written decree and act, that had been made part of the Constitution during the Constitution Assembly of 1949, convened under martial law at which time the power of the monarchy was increased in, various ways by the Shah himself as a precautionary measure, he flew to Baghdad and from there hid safely in Rome. He actually signed two decrees one dismissing Mossadegh, and the other nominating the CIA's choice General Fazlollah Zahedi as Prime Minister. These decrees called Farman's were specifically written, as dictated by Donald Wilbur the CIA architect of the plan, and were designed as a major part of Wilbur's strategy to give legitimacy to the coup, as can be read in the declassified plan itself which bears his name. Soon massive popular protests aided by Roosevelt's team took place across the city, and elsewhere with tribesmen at the ready to assist the coup. Anti- and pro-monarchy protesters both paid by Roosevelt violently clashed in the streets, looting and burning mosques and newspapers leaving almost 300 dead. The pro-monarchy leadership chosen hidden, and finally unleashed at the right moment by the CIA team, led by retired army general and former minister of interior in Mossadegh's cabinet, Fazlollah Zahedi joined with underground figures such as the Rashidian brothers, and local strongman Shaban Jafari, to gain the upper hand on 19 August 1953, 28 Mordad. The military joined on Q Pro Shah tank regiments stormed the capital and bombarded the Prime Minister's official residence on Roosevelt's Q according to his book. Mossadegh managed to flee from the mob that set in to ransack his house and the following day, surrendered to General Zahedi who was meanwhile set up by the CIA with makeshift headquarters at the officers club. Mossadegh was arrested at the officers club and transferred to a military jail shortly after. On the 22nd of August, the Shah returned from Rome on the 21st of December 1953. Mossadda was sentenced to three years solitary confinement in a military prison, well short of the death sentence requested by prosecutors. After hearing the sentence, Mossadda was reported to have said with a calm voice of sarcasm, the verdict of this court has increased my historical glories. I am extremely grateful you convicted me. Truly tonight the Iranian nation understood the meaning of constitutionalism. Mossadegh was kept under house arrest at his Ahmadabad residence until his death on 5 March 1967. He was denied a funeral and was buried in his living room, despite his request to be buried in the public graveyard, beside the victims of the political violence on 30 tier 1331, 21 July 1952. Mossadegh was named Man of the Year in 1951 by Time. What do you think of our list? Which of the facts about Mohammad Mossadegh shocked you the most? Let me know in the comment section below, if you enjoyed this video and want to hear from us again, be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go.